Hello viewers, welcome to Newsweek South Asia, a program that talks about breeding of terrorism and its impact on South Asian nations. Let's begin with the headlines first. Cross-border shelling by Pakistan kills three Indian civilians near LOC. Islamabad's claims of not aging terrorists fall flat as Pakistani passports seized from terrorists in Afghanistan. And Islamist radicals oppose temple construction Islamabad project halted. The mass elimination of Pakistani terrorists from Kashmir has baffled the country, which has increased cross-border shelling at the LOC to facilitate infiltration of more recruits from its terror launch pads and to supply arms and ammunition into Kashmir. Condemning Islamabad's devious designs of terror in Kashmir, researchers warn that Pakistan has been using terrorism as a tool to unleash violence and chaos in Jammu and Kashmir to frighten the locals and misguiding a section of population to develop distrust towards the Indian government and take up weapons. A report. Be it terror attacks or cross-border firing, Pakistan's evil designs against Kashmir have claimed thousands of lives, including civilians and security forces, since decades in the region. Jealous of Jammu and Kashmir's development and progressive policies, Islamabad is trying tooth and nail to revive terrorism in the valley. Between 2019 and 2020, Indian security forces have aggressively launched a series of counter-terror operations, eliminating several terror commanders and their recruits from Kashmir's Pulwama, Punch, Bandipura, Avantipura, Rajori, and support districts, to name a few. Various Pakistan-aided terror networks have also been dismantled under these operations. About 250 to 300 uh, militants are fully occupied in the launch pads. So this is a, a little disturbing news, but uh, since the Indian Army knows this information, there is nothing to worry about it as they have already killed two while infiltrating. Uh, as and when anyone tries to infiltrate, however strong they may be, Indian Army will kill them on the same spot from where they will enter. This uh, we have to take it uh, that we are fully alert now and we will not allow any such infiltration in the border. In response to its fallen terrorist and terror networks, Pakistani military immediately escalates the frequency of infiltration attempts of terrorists into Kashmir. This is done by intensifying cross-border shelling at the LOC to provide cover fire to the infiltrating terrorists that even claim the lives of Kashmiri locals living at the border villages. This week again, Pakistani troops resorted to unprovoked cross-border firing at the LOC, killing three people from Punch. The deceased were having dinner while sitting outside when a shell landed near them and exploded, killing all of them instantly. A man, a woman and a minor were among the ones killed. It was about 9 hours and 20 minutes. जो पहला बम था वो आन के उनके मतलब चुले के फांसी गिरा तो उस मतलब पहले ही फायर में उनका डेथ हो गया उसके बाद भी हमारा मकान के साइड में मतलब बहुत बम गिरे हैं। In order to protect the civilians from incessant firing from Pakistan side, the government has sped up the construction of bunkers for border villages. Local authorities in Baramula district of Jammu and Kashmir Union Territory are constructing the underground bunkers in full swing for civilians who often live in fear of shelling and firing at the border villages. As many as 18 underground bunkers will be built in the Uri area of the district, out of which work on six of them is underway. As bullets and mortar shells sometimes land on their properties, resulting in loss of lives, injuries and physical damages, the government has undertaken the task of building the bunkers along the border areas to reduce casualties during ceasefire violation. Border is about 2-3 km from there. When shelling was done, there was no loss. We didn't have to kill the first one. The government has given the first one. It's very big. It's made safety for people. While Indian Union government is dedicated 
towards safeguarding its citizens from the menace of terrorism caused by Pakistan, the latter is busy hatching conspiracies to inflict damage upon India. A viral video released recently shows hundreds of jihadists holding a meeting in Ali Sujal near Ravlakot, declaring that they will cross the LOC. The video is clear proof of how the vicious idea of jihad against Kashmir overwhelms the entire Pakistani establishment and a majority of its radicalized population. Countries from across the world solve bilateral disputes by indulging into amicable diplomacy, but Pakistan believes otherwise. This western neighbor of India uses terrorism as an alternate to diplomacy to resolve its issues with India. The country, which is lacking a secular structure and illegitimately holds a large section of land, consistently tries to target India's vibrant democracy, secularism and its boundaries by propagating jihadist ideologies from its territory and the territories under its forceful occupation. It is clear that Pakistan has issues with India because Pakistan is not a secular democratic state with the same kind of diverse constitution and diverse ethnicity which India has and India is feeling very proud of having. Pakistan is very reluctant to extend the same courtesies to its minorities and to its ethnicities. What is it doing? It's actually trying to create an issue in Jammu and Kashmir to extend the boundaries of Pakistan itself and its influence. And partly that's to do with keeping the attention on areas outside Pakistan itself. Pakistan, a country with a poor economic graph and crippled infrastructure, remains preoccupied in supporting terror activities against India. While its own civilians are suffering under poor governance during the times of pandemic, the country's leadership is busy architecting plans to hamper peace and tranquility in India. It is in Pakistan's interest to stop indulging into anti-India activities as soon as possible. Otherwise, the time is not far when it will be left isolated in a sophisticated global society. Pakistan's barbaric strategy to unleash terrorism is continuously exerting its influence in Afghanistan. On one side, Pakistan is playing a crucial role in US-Taliban deal aimed at bringing peace in the war-torn nation. On the other, it is consistently providing direct military and intelligence aid to Taliban to create unrest in Afghanistan. This dubious strategy of Pakistan was once again exposed when Pakistani passports were discovered from over 25 Taliban militants who were killed in a NATO airstrike in Kandahar province of Afghanistan, a report. Islamabad's claims to completely dismantle terror infrastructure in the country and withdraw its support from the terror organizations operating in Afghanistan have fallen flat. Recently, an airstrike by NATO rescue support in Kandahar province of Afghanistan killed over 25 Taliban insurgents who were planning to launch attacks on Afghan security forces. And several documents and ID cards recovered from slain Taliban insurgents revealed that they were Pakistani citizens. The Pakistan government and its intelligence service ISI have for long been claiming that it is not aiding terrorists in Afghanistan by sending Pakistani youth to create unrest in the war-torn nation. However, this recent operation has once again exposed Islamabad's bogus claims. Many of these Taliban operatives are actually Pakistan citizens. They are not Afghan citizens, they are Pakistan citizens. And they have been trained by Pakistan, by the Pakistan Army, by Pakistan ISI to promote and fulfill their objectives in Afghanistan. Uh, this has been known for quite some time, but I think there is, uh, this is clinching evidence. This is uh, incontrovertible proof that uh, these people, all of them, 
the or a large number of them uh, of the Taliban operatives are actually Pakistani citizens. They are in the mm -hmm. pay of uh, Pakistan uh, army and of the intelligence agency. And they have been working against the interest of Afghanistan and to promote the interest of Pakistan uh, in uh, Afghanistan. It is widely acknowledged that the ISI has given the Afghan Taliban sanctuary inside Pakistan and supported the Taliban's resurgence in Afghanistan after 9-11, especially the Haqqani network, to carry out attacks inside Afghanistan. Since the creation of the Taliban, the ISI and the Pakistani military have given it financial, logistic and military, including direct combat support. According to a United Nations report released in June 2020, Various Pakistan-based terrorist organizations too, especially lashkar e taiba plays a key role in providing recruits and funding to the Taliban and other terrorist groups operating in Afghanistan. The UN Analytical Support and Sanctions Monitoring Team in its 2019 report had acknowledged that of the 8,000 to 10,000 foreign terrorists in Afghanistan, most are from Pakistan. A recent report by US State Department also accused Pakistan for allowing groups targeting Afghanistan, including the Afghan Taliban and affiliated Haqqani network, as well as groups targeting India, including lashkar e taiba and its affiliated front organizations and jaish e muhammad to operate from its territory. The objective of Pakistan is to control Afghanistan against India to have a strategic depth in uh, Afghanistan and uh, to have a full control over the government in Afghanistan because uh, it would uh, like uh, now of course China is also getting involved so the objectives of both Pakistan and China are together so have uh, control over the territory of Afghanistan. Pakistan's constant support to the Taliban shows that it does not and did not ever intend to pursue peace in the war-torn nations, thus ensuring peace with a peace agreement that did not involve the elected Afghan government, but Pakistan's assistance can further push the region into turmoil. Experts say that Pakistan sees the Taliban as an insurgence policy for reaching its long-standing strategic goals in Afghanistan, installing a pro-Pakistan government in Kabul and limiting the influence of its archival India, which has close ties to Kabul. It assumes that India's deep presence in Afghanistan can hamper its devious nexus with the terrorists. Pakistan does not want India to play any role in Afghanistan because it knows that it will be at uh, Pakistan's expense. It knows that uh, Pakistan's influence will come down if India is able to have a role and India will be able to completely overshadow whatever uh, uh, Pakistan is trying to do in Afghanistan. That is why it has uh, been uh, uh, insistent and on uh, more occasions than one it has said that India has no role to play in Afghanistan and uh, should not be involved in any way. The efforts by America and the Afghan government have brought some war peace and stability in the region, but much is to be achieved in the coming days and months. Complete peace and tranquility can only be achieved if the Taliban puts down its weapons against the mainstream Afghan government and civilians. Till the time, Pakistan is providing shelter and aid to the Taliban's top leaders to operate from its territory. The end game in Afghanistan cannot be played behind Pakistan's back or to its exclusion. Meanwhile, the security situation in Afghanistan continues to remain tense. Despite the ongoing peace procedures, Taliban has escalated attacks on Afghan security forces and civilians, causing more atrocities and bloodshed. As a result, Afghan government too has now adopted an offensive posture against Taliban and has launched counter-terrorism operations against the group. 
Recently, Afghan government launched an airstrike in western Afghanistan that killed multiple people, including both Taliban militants and civilians. This incident comes as the second phase of U.S.-Taliban peace deal is moving forward. A report. While the Taliban has ramped up attacks against Afghan security forces and civilians in Afghanistan, Afghan government too has been blamed for irresponsibly targeting innocent civilians in their strikes against Taliban insurgents. Recently, a government airstrike killed at least 14 people in Afghanistan's western Herat province, including women and children. Witnesses say that hundreds of people had gathered in Herat's Adras Khan district to welcome home a former Taliban militant freed from jail when aircraft pounded the gathering. A day earlier, another airstrike struck the area of Herat province that killed at least 45 people, including Taliban insurgents and civilians. Acting Defence Minister Asadullah Khalid denied the allegations and said that the six Taliban militants were killed in Herat airstrike. Ministry of Defence said it was investigating allegations of civilian casualties in attacks by Afghan forces in the area and would soon make the findings public. The Afghan air forces should have been more careful or rather the Afghan government should have been more careful in using the air force. But these things have happened before. These things have happened when the Americans have used drones and drone strikes to try to neutralize militants and there have been uh, um, uh, civilian, ca civilian casualties, what, you, what we call collateral damage. That was also very wrong, should not have happened. But suddenly the United States seems to be hypercritical on this because uh, it wants to exit uh, Afghanistan. What happened was, as you have rightly asked me, that the Afghan government also has now become rigid. It has now decided that a soft uh, position vis-a-vis -vis the Taliban is just not working. They are, they are being taken advantage of and therefore they have hardened their positions and their tactics have also hardened. And as a result of this, while Taliban fighters also died, civilians also died. I think the Afghan government should be careful in basically calibrating their particular strategy. The U.S. Special Representative for Afghanistan Reconciliation, Salme Khalil Saad, condemned the airstrike and said that photos and eyewitnesses' accounts suggest many civilians, including children, were killed. The diplomat also slammed the Taliban Islamist movement for continuous attacks that resulted in large number of civilian casualties. He urged all sides to contain the violence and to immediately start intra-Afghan negotiations. The progress on the intra-Afghan talks for mutual peace agreement has been at a standstill due to complications with the prisoner swap that is laid out as precondition for negotiations. The American deal with the Taliban called for the release of up to 5,000 Taliban prisoners in return for 1,000 Afghan security forces held by the insurgents. However, Afghan authorities have refused to release 592 Taliban prisoners who are deemed dangerous and are accused of serious crimes. Meanwhile, in a major development, Afghanistan's Office of National Security Council has revealed that, in defiance of their commitments not to rejoin the war, a number of Taliban prisoners who were released from the Afghan government jails have reintegrated their colleagues on the battlefields. This system of incentives that existed was perfect for the Taliban because it was a low risk, low risk strategy. If you fight, you can die, but if you don't die, you are taken, taken prisoner, you will live to fight another day because after some time, uh, the so-called well-wishers of the Afghan government will persuade the Afghan government to let them go. This has become so endemic and this this bad faith shown by the Taliban and the Taliban fighters has contributed to the Afghan government hardening its, hardening its stance. The Taliban's recent attacks have taken a heavy toll on Afghan forces. According to Tolo News, an Afghanistan-based media organization, more than 250 Afghan security force members were killed and over 300 more were wounded in 220 attacks staged by the Taliban over the past three weeks in 11 provinces of the country. 
Civilians are bearing the brunt of this deadly conflict from both the sides as Security Council has accused the Taliban of carrying out 44 attacks and killing or injuring 24 civilians every day in the country since earlier this year. They have targeted the Hazaras because they have Shias. They have targeted pregnant women in the wards. So it's not just collateral damage where civilians die. It is the specific targeting of a specific ethnic group by the Taliban. And when we say civilian casualties, it has a tendency to obfuscate that. The country's conflict is back into full-fledged bloodletting after a brief period of hope that the deal between the United States and the Taliban would open the way for negotiations between the two Afghan sides. Although in the peace deal, the Taliban pledged to prevent Afghanistan's territory from being used by terrorist forces, this constant wave of attacks in Afghanistan has once again raised the concerns about the country's future. In a clear display of fundamentalist Islamic ideology and assault on minority rights, Pakistan has halted the construction of a Hindu temple in Islamabad. A temple which was said to be built after many hurdles once again lies in dichotomy with Islamic extremists protesting against the construction of Sri Krishna temple for Hindus in the national capital. Prime Minister Imran Khan, who votes to protect minority rights after assuming office, has kneeled down in front of jihadi Islamic clerics who spew venom against the minorities and every other religion except Islam to incite violence and extremism in the society. A report. Fatwa's religious bigotry and threats emerged from the Islamists against the building of a Hindu temple in Islamabad. The Islamist extremists even desecrated the under construction site and vandalized the temple's foundation to express their anger and disagreement against Hindu sentiments. They chanted slogan and video recorded themselves offering namaz with great pride. The proposed construction of Sri Krishna temple in Islamabad could be the first constructed Hindu temple in Pakistan's modern history. Halting the construction of a Hindu religious place is yet another reminder of how the space for religious freedom is shrinking in Pakistan. From common people to political leaders, everyone is ranting about religious supremacy of Muslims to undermine the need of a Hindu temple for the largest minority of the country. The federal government's ally and speaker of the Punjab Assembly, Chaudhary Parvez Ilahi said that building a new temple was against the spirit of Islam. Pakistan jo Islam ke naam par wujood mein aaya tha aur iske darul hukumat Islamabad mein naya mandir banana na sirf Islam ki roo ke khilaf hai balki ye raste Madina ki bhi tohin hai. Pehle se majood jo mandir hain unki marmat ki jaani chahiye. Humne bhi apne daur mein Kitas Raj ki marmat karayi aur bahali ka kaam karwaya tha aur pehli dafa अपने बजट में हर साल चर्चिस की रिपेयर के लिए भी हम पैसे रखते रहे। Minorities in Pakistan, be it Hindus, Sikhs or Christians, are facing persecution despite the constitution giving them equal citizen rights and the freedom to practice religion. The state lets the pressure groups treat minorities as third-rate citizens. Unfortunately, if anyone speaks about minority rights in Pakistan, he is being threatened and accused of committing blasphemy. A blasphemy complaint has been registered against PML and leader and former foreign minister Khwaja Asif over his remarks in National Assembly that no religion is superior to the other while referring to the temple issue. My question is, if any religion could establish their worship places at any part of the world, including their capitals, then why the Hindus could not establish their temples in Islamabad. These are the causes actually uh, 
that the minorities who were 23% in 1947 and now are decreased to 5%. And there are already the discriminatory laws and practices in routine. The Hindus and Christian girls convergence, the biased curriculum, the constitutional barriers, the academic issues. Activists from the Hindu community in Nepal and India protested against the atrocities committed against Pakistani Hindus. In Kathmandu, the protesters carried placards and burnt an effigy of Pakistan Prime Minister Imran Khan outside the Pakistan Embassy. They demanded the construction of Sri Krishna Temple in Islamabad and sought justice for minorities who have been suffering in the hands of Islamic fundamentalists. And with that, we come to the end of this edition of Newsweek South Asia. We'll be back next week with more news, views and analysis from the subcontinent. Meanwhile, do keep writing to us at nwsa at nin.com. This is Shreya Sabijay signing off on the behalf of entire production team of Newsweek South Asia. Goodbye and take care.